Thank you for attending um, today as we discuss Frisco Public Library and how they analyzed stack maps, ROI, and value. My name is Kim Kadu from EBSCO. Um, you can enter your questions at any time. We'll answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, right now, I'm going to introduce our first presenter, who is Alexa Roy. She's the Director of Sales and Marketing at StackMap. Okay, I'm going to pass this over to Alexa. Hi, everyone. Um, at this point, you should be seeing my screen. I am Alexa. I've been with StackMap for about three years, and I'm very excited to be showing you StackMap. We are an indoor mapping company. We specifically map libraries and we can do a whole lot with um, your space. We do collection mapping of the library. We can map your computers and their availability, your rooms, and also provide interactive maps so that um, one can easily interact with the maps and of course see different subjects in the collection as well as places in your library. What we're going to be going over today is a quick intro of the Frisco Public Library um, integration before I hand over to Elizabeth and she talks a bit more about it, but we'll discuss what their integration looks like as well as how it was put together. So here we are at the Frisco Public Library site. I'm doing a search for history in their catalog. What we've done in order to map their collection is we've placed some buttons on their records. So once everything starts to load in, you're going to start to notice there are these really cool green map it buttons. And that's where we come in. We put these map it buttons onto the catalog so that when one is looking in the catalog, they're able to click map it and then they will see, oops, sorry, they will be able to see a green map it button. So if they want to click on that, they're then going to see right in the catalog where that item will be. You can see on the map itself, the highlight right down the side of the range. So there is that highlighted range with the pin coming out from the center. That's how your user will know where to find that item right on that floor map. There are text directions off to the side as well where one can easily see step-by-step -step directions. You are able to customize these. So if you want to um, make turn-by-turn step-by-step directions here, you certainly could starting from some sort of a central point. The map itself can also be customized and I'll go a bit more into depth about that when we talk about the back end. Um, but typically we usually go off of your blueprints or any sort of emergency exit plan, you can help us to create your map. On the map, you can easily zoom in and zoom out. If you want to print the map to help somebody at the desk, perhaps you think that printing it and handing it to them so they have in hand would be helpful. You can certainly do that with this printer friendly button. Of course, if somebody is searching the catalog from their mobile device, this will appear there as well. When they click map it, the map will open up to fit the screen. We do find a lot of people tend to search the catalog at the OPAC and then take a picture with their phone and go from there, which is also fine with us. However you get it in hand is great. And then you can walk with it to your stack. The map it button itself can be customized. There's this really lovely green and that was chosen to match the search button. So if you want a different color, you can certainly do that as well. We can also change the, um, the verbiage on that button. So if you want it to say find it or locate it instead of map it, that will work as well. We can also customize when the map button appears. In fact, this is a great example of it right here. The map button appears when the item is available and on the shelf. When it's checked out, the map button disappears. And that's an option. I particularly like that option because I think it's a nice extra indicator that the item is available and they can go find it. Um, your users will start to see the map it button as 
a hint that it's a physical item that they're going to leave here today with. If you have any questions about what the integration looks like, please do ask in the Q&A box. Um, once Elizabeth starts up, I'll probably address some of those questions. We can integrate with any catalog you have. This particular one is a Searcy catalog, but um, we can integrate with all other catalogs using an integration script or a widget, or at the very least, we can use a browser extension. So not to worry um, regarding what type of catalog you have. Let's talk a little bit about how StackMap is set up. Um, this is a backend dashboard. You're going to be able to access this at any time. This is where you will modify your stack map and update it. It's also where we put together your integration. We only need two things to get you started with stack map. Those two things are some sort of a floor plan. So we're looking for a bird's eye view of your library, essentially. The other thing um, that we may, that we will want from you is a spreadsheet. That spreadsheet, we're going to ask you to insert your first and last column of your ranges. Both um, of those things I'm going to speak a bit more on, but I do like to get that out there right away that that's all you're going to need to get started. We will do all the rest. First things first, we are going to create those floor plans. So you did see the example for Frisco. That is one that has um, not much color in there. It's really perfect for accessibility reasons to have less color, but if you do want more color, that is an option. When we first set you up, we'll have a conversation about what you want that final map to look like. So perhaps you want something like this, um, where you can add in a key and some color and label rooms and your information desk. We're gonna wanna include landmarks to help people acclimate themselves onto your map. So that's a discussion we'll have when we get you started. But the basics we will get from that blueprint or emergency exit plan, from there, our graphics team will take care of the rest. This is also where we can start to add text directions. You'll be able to modify these at any time. You can see it's a preform text box there. So your map images are all going to be in here as JPEGs. So you are more than welcome to download them from here and use them for other things. They are your maps. So feel free to do that. Next up, we are going to talk about the ranges and how we place those on the map. Because you may notice on this map, there are no collections yet. And that is very much intentional. We actually place your ranges onto the map using this dashboard so that they are laid over the graphic as a live overlay. And this is so that you can very easily modify those ranges and move them about without ever having to download the map or put it into a different software, you're going to be able to do it right here. The first time you sign in, all of your ranges will be laid out uh, the way we do it. And I want to show you just because you should know that you can do this as well. You're welcome to sign in and add extra ranges. So if I add 20 ranges, it populates in the corner. From here, I, I can resize and drag and drop onto the screen. Screen. So this is the kind of nifty way that we get your ranges onto your map. From here, you can easily manipulate them, add, subtract. I'm going to delete the group that I just created. If you're ever considering moving things around in your library, perhaps you are um, changing your spaces a little bit to make space for other things, uh, feel free to use this to see how things might fit elsewhere. It can be very helpful for playing. Planning, uh, a lot easier than the tape on the floor method. This way you'll be able to see how things might fit elsewhere. And maybe you need to separate out some groups in order to make things fit. So again, this is for moving about your ranges. If you have ranges on rollers, this is something you might do more often. Uh, if they're bolted down, you might not ever need to do any, anything with this particular part of the dashboard. Something that everyone will touch at some point, though, is the data editor. And that's what we're going to talk about next. I mentioned earlier on that we are going to ask you to provide us a spreadsheet. That spreadsheet, we're going to ask you to fill in the first and last call number of your ranges. 
So what we're looking for essentially is your end cap signs. So if you have end cap signs on your ranges, that's exactly what we need. If they're saved and they're up to date, that's fantastic. Your job is done. You can just put that into the spreadsheet. If not, that's okay too. We can provide you methods of quickly collecting that information. Once we have that spreadsheet from you, we are going to take that and upload it to your dashboard. At this point, we'll make sure that all of the ranges are configured correctly and match up with the correct data. From this point on, you might never need to look at that spreadsheet again, which is a relief for some who may not like Excel so much. Uh, if you want to update your ranges, you can actually do it right here in the dashboard. So let's say I do a major shift. And now all of those call numbers are, are completely different. To update, you can just sign into the administrative dashboard, click on range and update the starting and ending call number. Nice and simple. Um, if you want to do this on a mobile device, I highly encourage that. You can actually take this dashboard out onto the floor and um, walk around with it on a mobile device click on ranges as you walk by them and update them. By doing this, you in turn are going to have all of your range signs automatically created for you. You can see here the entire floor of range signs. If you don't like this sign, that's okay. Uh, this is just very plain for, for demo purposes. We can certainly make this a lot nicer looking for you. If you have a template that you currently use and love, feel free to send that to us and we can get that going in here so that you can continue on with your normal range signs, um, but they're all going to be able to be generated very easily right from here. In fact, I usually like to say that you know you need to update stack map when your range signs are incorrect. And the great thing about this is this is going to help you um, kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. If you update stack map, you in turn have updated range signs. So it shouldn't add anything to your current process. Rather, it's going to streamline something you should already be doing. That's just about the end of the integration step. At this point, we would hook it up to your catalog. Um, different catalogs have different methods of integrating Stack Map. Some use integration scripts, some use widgets. In which case, we will provide you instructions. We've worked with a great number of catalogs, so we will send you instructions on how exactly to hook it up. Um, you might just need to copy and paste a script or turn on a widget. Either way, we've done it before, we'll be able to help you with that. You do have a number of support options. It's all included in your Stack Map subscription. You're going to be able to reach out to us at any time, so feel free to shoot us an email, give us a call. We love talking to our mapping libraries. If you ever need any help or a review on the dashboard, let us know. We're very flexible with our schedule, um, so we have no problem booking meetings outside of normal California hours. There's also this really great site that you can always go to as well if we happen to be sleeping when you're looking for help because we're in California and you're on the East Coast. Feel free to check this out, and there are videos of us performing any tasks you could be possibly trying to do in the dashboard. But of course, once again, just let us know, shoot us an email, we'll get right on the phone with you when we're in office. We'll do a training session too with anybody that wants to learn the dashboard. As you hire new people, let us know, and we will teach them as well. That's it for me for now. I will be joining you again later on to talk about some of the other modules as well as for the Q&A. But at this point, I am going to be passing off to Elizabeth, who is the Collections Manager at Frisco Public Library. And she is going to be uh, going over ROI. They did this really fantastic ROI study um, after having Stack Map implemented for some time. So now I'm going to pass the roll on. All right, thank you, Alexa. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of ROI or cost-benefit analysis um, using Stack Map 
as an example, right? I'm not selling the product, I'm a customer, but I'm not selling it. Um, but I wanna talk about, you know, using data and um, using uh, information to make really good decisions about the tools that we do use in libraries. And so kind of the techniques I'm gonna talk about today can be used for basically any product or service you're considering or that you already have. Um, and so, um, just to get started, not all of my slides are this pretty because really we're talking about a lot of things that are that are done in Excel. Um, I do like Excel. I, I think in spreadsheets now. Um, so I have I have put some book recommendations throughout my slide deck. I've tried to find items that I, I do recommend and that also relate to this slide. So hopefully um, if you're not really into cost benefit analysis and ROI, there's still something in this webinar for you today. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, so this is this is the second floor RU services floor in our library here in Texas. And just to give you a little bit of an introduction to Frisco, in case you're not familiar with, with the city of Frisco, um, we're in kind of northern Texas, close to Oklahoma. Um, it's a high growth city. Uh, there's a lot of development that's been going on for, for several years now. On the right, right side, you'll see um, what used to be called the $5 billion mile and now is called the Platinum Corridor here in Frisco where we have a lot of, of big development going on. Um, the city has been growing at a really fast rate. We see about 6% annual population growth. So just for example, between 2013 and 2017 alone, the city's population increased 24%. Um, back about 25 years ago, the city's population was eight, 9,000 people, and currently it's about 190,000. So we definitely deal with a lot of growth. And the city um, has a strong identity as um, a sports culture. The Dallas Cowboys have their um, uh, World Headquarters and Training Center here, um, Toyota Stadium, which is right across from the library, has the National Soccer Hall of Fame. We have a lot of sports. The PGA has just announced they're moving to Frisco. Um, so a lot of sports, but also a lot of technology. It's a tech sector. Um, so we're actually also starting to see some interest in developing esports as a, an industry here. Um, that does mean that we have a reputation for being an affluent community, and, and honestly, we are. There is there is a fair bit of money moving around the city. Um, what that does not necessarily correlate to is a really large budget for the library, right? Um, how does that work? Um, uh, we have more people, we have the same resources to serve them with. So um, this chart is a, a percent change year over year um, chart. So really it's showing you the ups and downs of how things are going. And you can see the blue lines, the population is steadily increasing every year over the previous year. Um, our collection size kind of wavers a little bit, largely based on the fact that, that our budget um, is pretty inconsistent. You can see that orange bar for the budget doesn't even show up in the middle of this graph, and that's because there was the budget was completely flat those years. We got the exact same amount of money. Um, and uh, occasionally, you know, we hit crisis and the city dramatically increases our budget for a year and then it drops down again the next year. Um, so we're constantly in the business of managing constraints. Our library director's father was an economist and so that's the phrase she, she's learned and, and we've learned from her. Um, we don't have enough to do what we really feel like we need to do or we don't have as much as we think we need to do what we need to do. And so we're always trying to manage our constraints and figure out how to make the best use of them. One of those constraints is, is money. You can see our collection budget. We definitely have some constraints there. Um, but one of the things that's not on this graph is staff time. Um, well, the city's population grows 6% annually. Our staff does, certainly does not grow 6% annually. And so um, the tighter a resource is, the less of it we have, um, the more important it is to use it wisely. And we believe that staff time is one of, one of those things that we really need to to make sure that we're using our staff as, as well as we possibly can to make sure that they can have the highest impact on our guests, that the interactions, the time we do get to spend with them are really valuable times and they're not just maybe all the directional questions that happen so much, especially in a public library. Um, so the first step really 
in, in thinking about ROI is to think about measuring the time investment in, you're making in something. Um, for those of us who, who are not volunteers in the library, um, our time is literally money, right? Every, every any time we're doing something and it's taking our time, that is actually costing money in terms of our salary. Um, but time also um, for our customers, that's money for them too. Um, so we got to think about, you know, as how this Rangan Athens law of library science that says save the time of the reader. How how can we apply that practically day to day? Um, and so that's one of the things that we really think about when you're thinking about ROI is you've got to think about the time you're investing, not just the money you're spending on something. And you know, Alexa covered these, and so I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, but using stack map as just one example of the way you do this when you're creating a product or setting up a service, you need to think about the amount of time you're going to invest that, not only in the setup stages, but also in the maintenance stages going forward. And if you can measure the amount of time something takes, you can very quickly get to a dollar amount for that time based on the salaries of the people involved. So, you know, a stack map as an example, you know, you've got your setup, so there's certain things you've got to do once and you can get done, create those maps, place the ranges, gather your call number data and, and upload that initial data set. But then over time, you still have some maintenance. You have to update the call number data as, as things shift and update the maps if you move things. Um, and so it's important to take those into account, you know, true confessions. When I did the ROI study on StackMap, I did not include this. It was it was a done deal. We'd already done all the setup, and and I need to go back and and figure out the maintenance on it. I haven't done that, so that's you know, uh, Lex and, and Alexa may regret asking me to do this because it's actually brought to my attention that you know I need to go into more detail with my ROI study on StackMap. We'll see how that turns out. But um, as Alexa. Like I said, kind of the first step is to create that floor map. Hopefully you have something better existing than we did originally. It was a, that was a bit of a challenge for us. And you're going to place those ranges on it. So here you can see in our teen room, we have highlighted uh, the range where um, my favorite author's books live. So um, you, you're going to do that. And then you've got to gather those call numbers. Um, because space is a huge constraint for us, um, we do kind of have to go out. I, I feel like we have to go out about annually. It should probably be more often than that and regather that data on on what's the first and last book on a, sh on a range because um, our, our materials shift a lot because we're so, so tight for space. I think if, if we weren't so tight on space, we'd be able to um, have things stay steady a little bit longer. Um, but so you're going to gather that call number data, and this is, you know, what it looks like on our fourth floor. And I, I tend to be old school, so go out and, and label all those ranges and then, you know, gather the first and last um, call number from each. I also like to compare that to the catalog to make sure we're not, there's not things that fall in between. And then upload that data into Excel um, or enter the upload it or, or enter it. I'm not too time consuming unless you're terrified of Excel. Um, and as, as Alexa said, you could do that live by, by taking a mobile device out to the stacks with you. That's a really, a really good tip to prevent some unnecessary extra steps in the process. Um, and then you're going to convert that time investment to monetary cost. So, you know, as it says on the screen, these numbers are purely fictional. I made them up for explanatory purposes because I have not actually done this. Um, but you take, you know, the amount of time, the hourly rate of the person who's doing it, you, you get your staff cost and, and you combine that and look at, you know, what's, what's the initial setup going to take me and then what's it going to take me to do maintenance going forward. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the, the basic gist, you know, you kind of figure out how much additional cost in terms of not only, um, the, the cost of the product, the check you're going to write or, uh, the DCO you're going to send, but also the, the cost and staff time. That's really important to consider. And then you can do the opposite. You start calculating your savings. Um, what, is, what is having this product or service going to save us going forward in terms of staff time? Um, and there's different ways to gather the, the data. Sampling is a good one. You know, just, just try a few things. 
you can generate a conservative estimate. This is what I did. The reason I have this particular book on the slide is because um, to figure out, you know, how how much time, you know, using Stack Map was going to save our staff. All I did was I went down to our second floor where our youth service collection is. I I talked to the staff member who's working the desk, and I said, we're gonna we're gonna make some assumptions. We're gonna assume I'm coming up to ask you for a specific book. We're gonna assume it's fairly close to where this desk is located. Um, we're going to assume that you don't have to look it up in the catalog. You know exactly where it was, because with a lot of juvenile fiction, that is that is the case. You know, everyone knows where Wimpy Kid is. Everyone knows where Dogman is. Everyone knows where those most popular things are among the staff. So you're not going to have to look it up every time. Because I wanted a very conservative estimate. What is the least amount of time that using Stack Map by a guest using Stack Map might save one of our staff members? I wanted to be highly conservative in my numbers. So that I wasn't making inflated um, statements about the value of it to us, and so we, you know, I gave her all these, you know, parameters, and then she literally walked me to to a book on the shelf that met all those criteria, and we timed how long that took her, and and for us it was like 30 seconds. So okay, so every time we use, you know, a guest use Stack Map instead of instead of having to ask a staff member. Um, for for assistance finding the item on the shelf, we can assume that it's going to save at least 30 seconds, and and then um, then you figure out your math on on what that um, that does for you. So you figure out okay, so 30 how much how much do we pay for 30 seconds of a staff member's time? That's that's pretty simple, right? Divide their hourly rate by 3,600 3, seconds in an hour, and, and you kind of figure out exactly. What what that time is is costing the city, and so from there you can then calculate your break even point. Um, you divide you know the the cost for the product or service by the uh, the cost of the staff member's time for that you know that amount of time that you're you're expecting, and and for us that kind of comes down to when we're talking about. A guest using Stat Map to find something on the shelf versus a staff member walking them to the shelf. You know, we can figure out that our break-even point is that we need um, about 14,000 uses of, of Stat Map a year for that to happen. Um, and then from that, we can track over time how much, how many uses do we actually get in a month? And you know, that's a really easy. Um, analytic point that that stack map has is run in a jump in every month and you know run one really quick little data set and um, and gather that over time and you can see that it's certainly not been a problem for us to exceed 14,000 uses of stack map a month we range from I don't know maybe about 1500 um, uses in a slow month to peaking in the summer at what, 2,800 or so. So we're definitely um, getting more use than that break-even point. And then from there, we can also figure out the cost per use. So the co annual cost of the product divided by um, the number of uses that we get. Um, and that kind of gives us a comparison for this is costing us more or less than the, the staff time to do the same thing would. And we know that not all of our guests use Stack Map. Um, but we do know, you know, it, we do know how many times that that map gets clicked, and uh, we do, you know, anecdotally we see it left up on the the OPACs a lot in the library where someone has obviously clicked on it and then walked off to go find the item. Now I will say that that my stats on or my numbers on this page do not um, calculate calculate in that that maintenance time, so the time to update stack map and update the call number ranges. Um, I like I personally like to use volunteers to kind of help keep those costs down. So I'll get a good volunteer and send them out to the stacks to double check the first and last call number on every range and, and that really reduces the amount of staff time to do it. Um, and that's that's kind of the whole process. It's it's really that simple. I would just, you know, the takeaways I have are when you're making decisions about a product, whether to to acquire it in the first place or to renew it over time. My my ongoing you know cry in the wilderness is make decisions based on data. Look at the data. How well is the product being used? Um, is it, is it adding value to your to your guests? You know, not only the look at both the quantitative, how much use is it getting? How does that compare to other products and services? 
um, the qualitative. Do our guests, you know, like it? Do we do we see evidence that they're using it? And also, what value is it giving back to us as an organization? Um, what can we, you know, how much staff time are we saving? What can we do with that staff time that's higher impact? Um, and and really think through all of that because you want to look at the total cost and the total benefit and figure in your constraints. You know, maybe you have more staff time than you know what to do with, and that's not an issue for you. Um, in which case, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but those are kind of the, the big deals for us. We look at pretty much everything in our library in terms of, of the cost, not only in terms of money, but in staff time, in terms of effort, in terms of the processes, and then also the benefits and, and what do we get back and make sure that those are in alignment and that both of them are moving us towards our big goals, right? Um, our mission statement is to um, enrich lives by inspiring intellect, curiosity, and imagination. So we want to provide products and services or acquire products and services that help us focus our time and effort on that. And that is pretty much all I have to say. So I know they've been manning the Q&A, and if there are any other questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, any questions? Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth. If you wanna ask questions in the Q&A or in the chat, I've got both of them open, please do so, and I will be keeping an eye on that. In the meantime, I guess I will ask Elizabeth some questions. So you said a lot about some of the quantitative information. Just at the end, you start touching on the qualitative data. So you know the what you hear from people, and mm -hmm. do you have any insight into what you have heard from your, your patrons as well as your staff regarding Stack Map? We we often don't hear a lot, um, and honestly, I'm a big proponent of. Um, function over form, right? If it's if it's practical, I'll take it over it being flashy any day of the week. And so that's hard in some ways, right? Because everyone loves the new and sexy and cool stuff. And um and I think there's a bit of an element of that with Stack Map, but for the most part I, I think it's a very practical tool. Um we're on four, our library's on on four well, the public spaces are on three different floors of the building. Um the fourth floor, let's see, if I go back a couple slides um, so you can see it. The the way the ranges um, are set up on the fourth floor, um, kind of an almost a chevron pattern, oops, I went too far, um, can make it really hard to navigate. It's not necessarily intuitive to our guests. Getting there, that's the first floor. Next slide. Right, so um, that was one of my challenges setting up the, the ranges in the first place. Nothing is parallel or perpendicular to a wall anywhere in our building when it comes to our ranges. And so um, we have heard from some guests that where the maps really helped them figure out where they needed to go in the library in order to find what they're looking for. A lot of times we don't hear anything. And for me, that's just often a sign that a product is working the way it's supposed yeah. to, right? There's it's 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 doing the job and um combined with you know seeing those maps left up on the opacs around the building you know there's that sense that people are using it and then in addition to that anecdote we have the data on on how many times that map it button is clicked on on a um on a daily basis or on a monthly basis it, you know i i only look at it monthly but the data can be more granular than that um so i don't you know, I don't have lots of quantitative. We definitely occasionally hear from people who, who think it's great because it helps them navigate. And we're looking in about three years to moving into a new building. Well, it's not a new building. <laughs> we are moving into a building that will be renovated um, to, to serve as a library. And here in Frisco, um, the plan is one building, one library building. So the city plans to, I don't know, reach 250, 300,000 people, but they only plan to have one library. And so this building is the size of a super Walmart and it'll have a mezzanine level. And so when you think about helping people navigate a space that large to find a single book or a single item, um, the more intuitive you can make it and the more tools you can give them, um, I think 
the the more valuable that is because we we don't expect our staffing level to increase even though the the size of the building will be increasing like threefold so oh, yeah yeah so which is you know as you know i keep saying look we want we want live step-by-step -step internal navigation you know i know it's just a little ask but that's you know kind of the next step we're looking for is is really guiding people, especially so many using mobile devices, from where they are in the building to that that item, being kind of alive and 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 dynamically. Yeah, and that's so, certainly something that we have eye, our eyes on too, of course, for development. Um, there are absolutely there as you've already said, there are other challenges with that kind of tech, but um, that oh, is yeah. we're going. Just a few. <laughs> yeah, just a few. Um, since I'm not seeing any questions at this point, I'm going to do a quick review of some of the modules that you can add on to StackMap. And I will continue though to keep an eye on the Q&A. And after we go over those modules, I'll, I'll pause for another moment to see if anything has popped up. So please do um, send in your questions as you have them. But I'm going to share my screen once again. So Elizabeth, if you could oh, just pass the ball over sure to me, yeah. then I will take a look at some of the other modules. Absolutely, there you go. Excellent, awesome. Okay. So you should be right back to seeing, seeing my screen again. So let's go over some of the modules. We just went over collection mapping. Um, but there are other modules that we can also integrate at your library. One of them is Explore. And what Explore does is it allows you to interactively map the library. These maps that can then go on a touchscreen kiosk, or they could even go on your website. So from here, you're seeing UC Dublin actually has this integrated on their website. And the vision for this was sort of like when you walk into a mall and you see that, um, that kiosk where you see all of the maps of the floors and the different stores. Uh, so this is modeled off of that. So ideally, this would go on a touchscreen kiosk, but not all libraries have that yet. So this could also go on your website. And it's going to allow your users to interact with the library by finding things. Because finding things is kind of our thing. So off to the left you're going to see a list of subjects as well as a list of places. On the right side, you have all of your floor maps. Now, the lists of subjects and places are completely customizable. So if these do not look like the list you would want for your library, don't worry. Uh, you will be able to build your own list when we get you set up with Explore. Now, at this point, if I am a user or a patron in a library and I want to just browse, there are many times when people come in and they don't have something in particular in mind. They just want to know where are the art books or just have a general question like that. What this does is it allows them to actually browse and see where the area is that contains what they're looking for. So it's great for somebody not quite ready to jump into the catalog. They can continue to browse by topic here. And as you can see, so if you're going to switch up which ranges are highlighted. The other thing that they can do is also search by place. So one of the number one questions at the information desk is of course, where are the restrooms? Using this, they can actually highlight exactly where they are. I can now see all of the floors that have them. From here, I can drill down and see them highlighted on the map. The highlight um, can be a different color, so not to worry if you're having a hard time seeing this particular color, we can do a different overlay color. We can also highlight other places, so things like group study rooms or meeting rooms, your information desk, elevators, water fountains, anything you want can be highlighted on the map. Everything is also clickable, so if you wanted to click on something and browse around that way, that also works. As I click, I'm gonna be able to see a tooltip that will show me what the place is, and you can even include a short description. Um, I've actually seen some pretty lengthy ones too, though. And in that description, you could even put a permalink if you want to send them out to a website with more information on that location. So that's Explore. Again, this is an add-on module to collection mapping. 
great for your kiosk or your website, helps you interact with the library. Next up, for a, another module, we have computer availability mapping. What this does, as you can imagine, is it maps the computers in your library, and then it's going to show their availability. So the computers are red when they're in use and green when they're available. This example is at Case Western University. The great thing about computer availability mapping is it's going to allow your users to see in real time what the status is of your computer lab. They could view this from home, from your website, from their car, um, from the classroom. And this is going to give one a really good idea of if they're going to be able to get onto a computer if they went to the library right now. But it's especially perfect in a very congested computer lab. You could also have this on displays as the um, user walking into the library so that they can look up and know what floor to go to for an available computer without having to wander around. If I hover over a computer, I can see the operating system running on it. If you wanted to put a list of um, specialty software running on individual computers, that's a great idea as well. If you have something like a maker lab with some higher end software on individual computers, that's a great way to highlight that. The way this works is it is script based. So this will um, work alongside any computer management system you have. We will provide you an integration script that will ask you to push out to all of your computers with that script running on the back end of the computer as your users sign onto it or sign off of it using your computer management system, that event will trigger our API and change the color on the map. If you don't have a computer management system, that is okay. We can also do this based on sleeping states, screen savers, keystrokes. There are other events that we can tap into to figure out the availability. There is a back end dashboard for this as well, where you can easily drag and drop computers around and move them. Um, as well as get some great analytics based on the use of the computer that will help you determine what you need to buy more of and even where you might want to move them to. Our final module is room mapping. And what this does is it allows you to integrate maps into your room booking system. This room booking system happens to be LibCal. What we provided were map images for upload into that system so that when users were booking rooms, they can see under the information where the room will be in the library. So this is a fairly straightforward integration. We would provide you the map images on the back end of your room reservation system. You would then upload it to the individual room where they allow for a photo upload. If you don't have LibCal, that's okay. We can work with any other one as well. Of all of the room booking systems I've seen, every single one has allowed you to upload a photo for a room. So that would be where the map itself would be placed. Those are our additional modules. Just to do a quick review, today we went over collection mapping, which is the integration with the catalog. We went over the back end of collection mapping and how it's set up and maintained. Elizabeth spoke to us about ROI at Frisco Library. When I jumped back on, we talked about Explore, which is interactive mapping. That can go on a kiosk or your website, computer availability mapping, and room mapping. So at this point, um, let's move to the final slide, and I'm going to check once again to see if um, we have any other questions. Um, Kim, if you would, or, or Elizabeth, there we go. So we have the final slide up on the screen. You can see all of our information. If you're looking for more information, please do follow the instructions on that slide. You can always send me an email. Um, let's see. Can I just put those um, links, the link to your website and your email address in the um, chat area? Lovely, perfect. And it doesn't look like anyone has brought in any questions since then. So um, that's it for me. Thank you so much for joining. I um, hope to hear from some of you soon. Great. Yeah. And thank you, Elizabeth. We really appreciate that. Um, Alexa, I just have to say I love that feature with the um, computer availability. I think that's oh, my favorite. Oh, cool. 
<laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's, right. That's so nice to hear. Uh, All right, guys. Thank, um, thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, I think we'll be sending out some follow-up emails, too, if you want to share the link yeah. to the recording. That would be great. Okay. Thanks, Have a good guys. Day, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.